Hello and welcome to the Warshipologist. You're watching a channel devoted to the history of the USS Wasp CV-7 and we're looking at her story through photographs and other historical documents. In the last episode we looked at the Fall River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts and the earliest photo record that I have of the Wasp was dated as Friday the 8th of July in 1938. In this episode we're going to look at four photos taken before the launch. Our next photo of the construction process comes a little over two months later on Wednesday the 5th of October 1938. So that's almost six months before the launch. So what's happening in the world? Winston Churchill makes a speech in Parliament condemning the Munich Agreement as an unmitigated defeat. The previous Saturday, German troops marched into the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And this coming Sunday, the Yankees will beat the Chicago Cubs to win the World Series, the first time a team has won three on the bounce. OK, judging by the long shadows pointing eastward, it's a nice sunny Wednesday afternoon at the Fall River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. This photo seems to be taken from an identical position to the previous photo, but has been zoomed in somewhat. The first thing that stands out to my eyes is that someone has written information on the photograph. TRBHD13, I think means transverse bulkhead frame 13. All US aircraft carriers from USS Ranger CV4 had their frames at intervals of four feet. If we go to the plans, you can see frame 13 running back from the forward perpendicular. This is where the forward part of the hull intersects the waterline, which in this ship is between the two forward support columns. 13 times 4 is 52, so bulkhead 13 is 52 feet aft of these two columns. A bit further back on the starboard side, we can see BHD 36, 5 slash something. I, I can't make out uh, the other number. But it's interesting because frame 36 is mentioned in the loss report as the impact point of the first torpedo in the South Pacific. But more on that later. The flight deck has been marked on the photo and it's interesting to see the rectangular panelling used. This pattern can be seen in the pictures from the wreck obtained by the petrol. On top of the flight deck you can see a temporary workshop and to the right a makeshift worktop. Just forward of bulkhead 36 you can see a square shaped box. This is the space for the forward elevator that was never installed. The idea was that if the deck edge elevator proved to be a failure, they could always install an inboard elevator at a later date. However, in the end it proved successful and an improved version was employed in the Essex class. The forecastle deck is nearly complete and we can see large holes cut out of the deck. The holes on the outside are where the support columns for the flight deck will be positioned. The columns for the two most forward holes are actually slanted outwards, which we'll be able to see in our next image. The hole in the centre line goes down to the windlass room which we looked at in the previous image. If we look at the bow, we can see the stem plate has been added, but none of the plating on the rest of the hull seems to be there. It's interesting to see the sheets of panel that make up the deck, like some 50 ton jigsaw. It fits well in places and not so well in others, and some of the edges seem a little rough. A group of three men are working up forward. Two are crouched on the deck, and another is standing on the scaffold around the hull and appears to be looking directly at us. 
One man seems to be measuring something, steel or wood, or perhaps it's a template. A tool lies to the right of the man kneeling down. They look like calipers. Maybe you can identify this tool. A bit further after these men, there are three men who are wearing shirts and trousers. They don't look like your typical shipyard worker. Perhaps they're the project managers. They're passing two workers. One is on the left, standing next to a large box with rings. And to the left of the box is a sheet of thin material with different sized holes cut out. Perhaps it's a template. It seems quite flimsy and doesn't sit flush on the deck. So here we are, it's Monday the 3rd of April 1939 and it's the day before the launch. Just over three years of construction and still over another year before she's officially handed over to the Navy. Again this picture is from the same position as the previous two. It looks like a gloomy Massachusetts spring day and therefore difficult to tell the time of day. In this photo you can appreciate the vastness of the flight deck, freshly cut steel. This will soon be planked over with Douglas fir wood, and here you can see the two tracks for the hydraulic catapults that have yet to be installed. This image really gives you a feel for how big these type of ships were. Further aft you can see two spaces for elevators number two and three. There are four black lines going athwart ships, and these are the expansion joints to prevent the flight deck from buckling in hot climates. There are two men standing on the forward flight deck. The man on the left is dressed like a businessman or perhaps a director, and the man on the right looks like a yard supervisor. On the forecastle deck, are the two angled support columns that I mentioned in the previous photo. You can see how the weight of the flight deck is directed down towards the keel. You can also see two sets of bollards for tying off mooring lines. The terrace scaffolding around the hull has been removed so now we can actually see the hull. You can see how the bow narrows down to the waterline and then flares at the forefoot. Just a bit further back is the launching cradle, which is taking the weight of the ship. There was another one aft. The cradle is sitting on two greased tracks, and when the bracing timbers are removed, the ship will slide into the Fall River, and effectively will be borne. It's interesting to look at the floor of the slipway. It looks incredibly clean and tidy for a shipyard. It does give the impression of some kind of closure, And at the very bottom of the picture, a platform has been built to hold the dignitaries and guests who will view the launch tomorrow. You can see a small extension where the sponsor will smash a bottle of champers against the hull. And to the right of the platform is a raised gantry, and this will house the members of the press who will record the launch from this position. Here's another shot taken on the same day, but from a lower angle. In this image, you can appreciate how high up the ceremonial platform is. It's interesting to see how the flight deck is supported from this angle. The cross beams line up right at those angled support columns. Along the sides of the hull, you can see about 10 lines coming from the portholes and going down under the hull. I think that's to secure the launching cradle that we saw in the previous photo after the ship is afloat. Uh, the cradle would be underwater and then can be easily retrieved by uh, pulling these lines. Another point of interest is the thick light band above the water line that runs fore and aft. I would imagine this to be some kind of primer. I've seen it in other ship launch photos. Ranger, for example. This final picture of the ship before launch was taken from the ceremonial platform looking up at the bow. 
It's a great picture to show the shell plating that formed the outer skin of the ship. Each steel plate was bent and pressed into a precise shape and then welded onto the frame. The stem plate seems to be made from two sections above the waterline. You can see some heavy welding on the left side. This area would take the full impact of anything the sea throws at her. If we look closer you can see numerous dots. These are eye bolts that have been screwed into the shell plating. You can see where a line has been secured to one. These are useful when painting the hull. Here's a nice photo of USS Yorktown CV-10 at Norfolk Navy Yard in July 1943 to illustrate the point. And finally, it's interesting to see that the photo is labelled number six. We saw photo number three earlier in this episode, so there are at least six photos in this series. I wonder what happened to the others, probably sitting in a dusty file somewhere. That's it for this episode, and as always, please comment below and add to the discussion. In the next episode, we'll look at the launch, so join me then, and thanks for watching.